I don't know if I was standing or sitting or what, but I'm not connected to the body on the bed, but I'm, I'm there just observing this. And then this panorama of, now think about this, because you've dealt with a lot of uh, near-death experiencers. They have a life review, but it always goes backwards. Right, you know, well, eight years old, where's it gonna go? It's gonna go forward, there ain't nothing to go backwards to, right? 50 years forward. Good evening, and welcome to the show Earth to the Other Side. I'm your host, John Glasspool. Thank you very much for being here. Tonight, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming my guest, Vietnam vet, Reverend Bill McDonald. His multiple near-death experiences have included meeting great masters who have provided him with some answers to his life's purpose and personal mission. He's an author, award-winning poet, international motivational speaker, an artist, film advisor, consultant, veteran advocate, and he's literally spoken to people all over the world. He's been given the gift of pre-recognition, and his awakened perspective as a reverend truly bridges the beauty of religion and spirituality. Also, I'd really like to thank my friend Lilia over at NDE Radio for introducing Bill and I. Much appreciated. If you haven't checked them out, please do so. Their link is in the description. His legacy is love. Bill, thank you for being here. Welcome to the channel. Well, thank you for inviting me. You're a brave soul. So um, I wanted to maybe start off with your first NDE, which I suppose happened as a child. I think you were eight years old. I'll give you the floor. Let's let's hear all about how that started. Well, you know, I, first off, I start off life very young. I don't know if you know that. Uh, I was so happy about being born. I was speechless for a year. Uh, okay. Actually, a usual thing happened when I was born. My mother goes to the hospital. I'm like her third kid. And she, I've had kids before. She tells the doctor, but I know I'm delivering. It's time to, no, 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 no. We're going to give you an enema first, you know, get you, 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 long ways from delivering. Well, turns out in the middle of this enema, I plop, I'm born into a bedpan. So instead of being born with this silver spoon in my mouth, I'm, I'm born with a mouthful of crap. And it's been, it's been uphill ever since. So there I am. So it's, it was about the most humble beginning that you could start with, right? I mean, born in a bedpan. Come on, you know. <laughs> Who can say that, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah so it, it is what it is. Anyway, so in in the, around 1954, uh, I was greatly sick. When I mean I was sick, I was going to school and nobody was paying attention to me, but I kept losing weight. I looked like a POW or something. I looked really. You know, I had I had uh, pneumonia in both lungs. I had a pleurisy of the chest that were filling up with fluids. I had a, a stage four, stage five kidney disease, whatever it was, uh, Bryce disease, they called it back then. And uh, and it was painful for just standing up. You know, it was just, I was bent over. It was, I had the mumps on, and I had three or four other illnesses all at once. It started with getting the case of the mumps. And and then everything kind of breaks down from there, your body, you know, it's it. Mumps really opens up a lot of other things. I don't know why, but it did. So by the time a doctor discovered me and they sent me off to the hospital and uh, I'm immediately put on a gurney and I hear him talking to my stepdad and my mom, uh, you know, it's too late. I mean, you're bringing the kid in, this kid's, you know, uh, we're gonna do what we're gonna do, but uh, uh, don't expect him to live. So. They just waved goodbye to me. And this is the old days, right? You know, there was none of these children's hospitals and clowns and, and all the neat things they do for kids. It was strapping a gurney. I'm taken to isolation ward, which was outside of the hospital. They got the hospital big structure in San Jose. And they got this wooden building out in the back, you know, for these diseased people that, you know, danger, right? So you go into this wood building uh, and and, and I'm, at first night I'm there, uh, never been away from home. I'm just eight years old, right? I'm all by myself, nothing. And nobody's talking to me. Nobody's telling me what's going on. Nobody called me by my name. You know, it's not like Bill or nothing. Just, hey, kid, sit down here. Boom, boom. And they start shoving these big needles in my back and pumping out all this fluids. It looked like, it looked like applesauce. It came out really thick, this fluids. And it was painful, and I'm in my underwear, and they're doing all this stuff to me, bent over a chair. It was really weird. Uh, and and then they just got through and said, okay, kid, get in bed. 
and I'm in this bed in a dark room and they all leave. That's it. Nobody, nobody hold your hand. Nobody's saying what's happening. Nobody's saying, are you okay? How do you feel? I mean, it wasn't any of that stuff. It was like, you know, if you survive, you're good, right? So I'm laying there that first night in a totally dark room. And all of a sudden my body feels light. And I mean that with both both definitions. Light, like light, lightweight, you know, float, like floating. And also light, like light. Let there be light. That kind of light, right? So it was like, when I say I, it was light, it was it was dealing with both those elements. And, uh, and then the room got a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. It looked like I was in a cloud. And I'm looking down and I'm seeing the body of, of little Billy, you know, me, the old me, right? I'm, I'm laying down there in the bed. And, I, and I'm, that's how I'm thinking. I'm thinking, well, I feel sorry for that, that body. That, that's hurting. That person's hurting. But that's not me. I'm not the body, right? I mean, I know that. I'm just, so I'm having this little inner conversation with myself, but I'm looking at my body. And then I look up and it, and it just like big clouds roll in. And then I'm feeling this hug. That's the only way. I was, people say, "Oh, you, you know, you're, you're, it's 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 love. It's it. No, it's a. It's really a spiritual hug. I mean, you're really feeling it. It's like bliss. If there ain't another another definition of it, that's it. It's just you're loved. And like at the time, I when I told somebody about this, one of the first times I told somebody trying to describe how it felt, because I, you know my mother was Italian, my grandmother was Italian, and uh, I, I said, you know, it's like. A million Italian grandmas. Now oh, they want to hug you, right? They want to pinch your cheeks, you know, and, and feed you spaghetti. It's like that feeling, right? So, manja, manja. Yeah, yeah, you know, hey, you know. So, it, it was, it was a wonderful feeling. There was no pain, and I was, I don't know if I was standing or sitting or what, but I'm not connected to the body on the bed, but I'm, I'm there just observing this, and then this panorama of. Now think about this, because you've dealt with a lot of uh, near-death experiencers. They have a life review, but it always goes backwards. Right, you know, well, eight years old, where's it gonna go? It's gonna go forward, there ain't nothing to go backwards to, right? 50 years forward. I was eight and a half, and uh, I saw things that were gonna take place when I was 59 and a half. You know, it was like, it, it, it was it was going and uh, I saw I saw Kennedy assassination I didn't know who he was I've seen a guy that I'm picking up that's the president and I see the guy you know falling over in the seat of the a convertible and now mine wasn't so accurate because what I saw doesn't agree with what the Warren Commission sees so uh, I'm probably wrong but there was more than one shooter so I don't want to be controversial or, or you know uh, a conspiracy buff, but what I saw could be wrong, but there was more than one shooter. All right. In fact, in my vision, basically, it looked like Secret Service agent fell or juggled his gun or something in the back vehicle and, and fired in his head. That's what I saw. But what do I know? Wow. So, uh, and that would explain one reason why they haven't released the data on that yet and we'll, why it would be a big cover up. Because one well, of their own did it accidentally. I didn't see it as intentional, but you know, Harvey was shooting. And uh, so, and I saw, I saw my wife was, I mean, you know, who my wife would be. And uh, I saw her in high school and I saw her, us getting married and I saw the houses we were gonna live in. I saw my children, uh, I saw Vietnam. I didn't know it was Vietnam. All I know is there was helicopters flying around and there's, Guy shooting, and uh, I saw all these scenes unfolding. I knew it was a war, and but I was seeing it all as if I was sitting behind a machine gun on a Huey helicopter. But I didn't know what a Huey helicopter was when it invented. So, but I, I I got this vision of sitting behind a machine gun on a helicopter. So I'm seeing the war pretty much like that, and then I'm seeing other scenes and things. That's why uh, people go, "Oh, you were so brave in Vietnam," and I said, "No." I knew it was going to happen. I don't know if you can see on the wall over here, this wall over here, you know, that's some of them. I got boxes of these things, you know, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, Sandwich Flying Cross, Air Medals, 
you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and they go, oh, you were brave. And I'm saying, no, the guy that didn't know what was going to happen in the next minute, the guy that didn't know if he was going to live or die, and he had fear, that's the hero. You're afraid. I mean, you know, me, I'm out there. There's, I'm walking across battlefields and explosions. There's bullets going by. I'm going, hey, you know, come on. This is not real. It's all a dream, right? It's just, in fact, when I was in Vietnam, I, I was into heavy, heavy action. I mean, I really was. It's some bad stuff. But it was like, I'm up here, even there, during that experience, I'm, I'm doing what I got to do here, but I'm actually watching myself. It's, I don't know how to explain that, but I'm actually watching myself as an observer, thinking, oh, yeah, I remember this. Oh, no, this, this is interesting. We've been here before. We've done it. Anyway, so I saw Vietnam. I, I saw all kinds of things in my future that was going to roll out. And, and I, then I kind of went back to my body and wake up the next day and, and I'm not dead. So that's good. That was a good thing when you wake up and not dead. That's an old Irish thing. You know, the Irish, if you wake up in the morning and you don't wake up dead, that's a good day. So I spent one year in the hospital as a child, one year. I mean, that's a long time, right? No, I, I didn't go. I didn't go to school classes or nothing, and so I had that whole year of my life kind of. And we didn't have clowns and entertainment and uh, special events for you know the kids in a hospital. I mean, a lot of my time was alone, and uh, holidays, Christmas, no special anything. Easter, nothing special. Thanksgiving, nothing special. Uh, birthday, nothing special. I didn't, have, I didn't have a TV, didn't have a radio, didn't have a record player, didn't have any toys, didn't have any magazines, newspapers, nah, books, nothing. So it was like, but that was the best that ever happened to me. But tell you why, because when you got to spend 24 uh, seven for a whole year with absolutely nothing on the agenda, but cutting you, shooting you, doing medical stuff, right? The rest of the time, nothing. I mean, I was total bed rest. Couldn't get up, walk around. I mean, nothing. It was, you had to lay there all day long. You know, they wake you up at six o'clock in the morning because the shift changes and they got to give shots. And then they turn the lights off at nine o'clock at night. I'm going, uh, but no activities, nothing. But I learned to go within and I learned to touch those places in you. And from that experience, I could sit still for days. I mean, if, if I show up someplace and, and, and the guy, you know, is an hour, two hour late for an appointment, doesn't phase me. The army, hurry up and wait, didn't phase me. I mean, I, I can wait days for something, you know, it's like, no, it's it. I don't need instant gratification. And I learned that when you close your eyes, it doesn't matter where you're at in the world, you're always in the same place. It's your own inner cave. So these people, well, I want to go to India like you, Bill, and I want to go to the Himalayas like you did. I want to go to Machu Picchu and, and all these sacred places. I said, close your eyes. Meditating in your own wherever you're at is the same difference as these holy places. Well, there's greater energy there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, but ultimately everything is within you. Everything, including the healer, the teacher, the guru, everything is within you. And that's the message that people don't want. It, it's like, oh, I got to go. I have to go and find something outside of myself. I got to find somebody outside of me that's not me to teach me. I got to find a healer outside of me. I got to find a leader. Well, if they're really in tune with the spiritual path, they learn that the healer was within, the guru's within, the teacher's within. Your life is here. It's it's. Nothing is outside of you. Nothing. So that experience kind of taught me that. And, uh, but during that, whatever you want to call the unrolling of the future, I also had two numbers. This was the weird part. I didn't understand for decades. There was a number 29, and then it would flip around kind of like in the air, and then it 29 looked like a 59. If you take a two and a five, they're kind of close, right? When you flip them over. It's, yeah. So it was like 29, 59, 29, 59. They kept flipping over in this thing. And so I was thinking, well, maybe I'm going to die at 29. Maybe I'm going to die at 59. I didn't know. 
And, and then years later, some astrologer, couple of oh, that's your Saturn. It comes every 29, 59 years, you know, and it's kind of like a symbolic death you change. I said, okay, great. But it was when, after, or when I was having my uh, second near-death experience that I kind of figured out what that meant. And then we'll go right, segue right into that if you want me to, because I, I go from this near-death experience at, at eight years old. And first off, you got, you can have people on your show. I had a near-death experience and, you know, now that I'm enlightened, no, you had an experience for a few minutes, an hour, whatever. You're not enlightened, you're not 24 seven enlightened walking around. I'm sorry. I'm glad you feel good about it and you discovered something about yourself and you're no longer fearful of death and maybe it's opened some doors, but you're still the same person with some subtle changes. Mm -hmm. Got some advanced, you know, information or some communication. Great. I'm happy for you. But to find God, to seek God, doesn't mean you got to go out and have your death experience. If that's the way it was, you have to do it. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Why go to church? Just go die someplace. I mean, so finding finding meaning in life and purpose in life and who you are, what you are, and and following your spiritual dharma doesn't have to entail a near death. In fact, if you take it philosophically, like the Indians do, or the Bible, you know, the Bible said, daily I die. In the New Testament, the guy said, daily I die. And I never heard any Catholic church, Protestant church, anybody ever interpret that. My interpretation is that is it's an inner dying. It's it's dying to the old. It's you know going breathless. That's you know, and you reach in through meditation, you're breathless, you're dying. There's a lot of things involved with daily I die. You don't have to actually you don't have to actually physically be dying. Anyway, so uh when I was just out of the hospital, uh I was nine years old, and I was concerned about my health. Because seeing that 29, 50, I think, well, maybe I have a health problem or something, you know? So I became a vegetarian at nine years old, only one in the family. And trust me, in the 1950s, there was no special meals anywhere for vegetarians. If you go in a restaurant, fast food, nada, nada, nada. That's yeah, difficult just, enough now as it is. I imagine. Yeah, yeah. But at least there's a recognition. In the real world, all food is made out of atoms. So it's like, you want to kill a tomato? You want to kill a zucchini? They got, they feel pain. They're, they look at you as a cannibal, you're eating them. You're, you're one of the same few genetic differences. So I did it because I wanted to be physically healthy and it was a sacrifice because at the time, the Catholic church used to practice this uh, no meat Fridays, which meant you eat fish and chicken and turkey. I mean, big sacrifice. Uh, so I said, well, hey, look, I got my life back. I ain't eating, you know, meat at any time, right? I just, I just gave it up. So at uh, age of 59, I was getting a little concerned. I'm going, wait a minute, this is as far as my life vision went. I reached that point where Nothing was deja vu anymore. It was like, oh, this is like, how could, and I thought, how could people live their lives not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow? I had that thought. I go, how do people do that? How do you get up in the morning and, and, and not know what's going to happen and, and be okay with that? And I finally understood why maybe maybe people were depressed or anxiety ridden because I, I always know what's going to happen, right? So, it's, but now I'm getting down the, the, the end of this trail and I'm going, Whoa, whoa, you know. So I go to India because uh, when I was nine years old, I read Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, which there's a chapter in there how he meets uh, uh, his guru, but there's a great chapter in there about how his guru's guru, Larry Masha, met Babaji. In other words, he was called this Himalayan cave and he meets this great avatar. And at the time reading that at nine years old, uh, I had my idea what an avatar was. I don't think the American public knew what an avatar was or, you know, this great being. I mean, they didn't even know what karma was or dharma or all these things that you accept now as daily language. In the 1950s, this was new to everybody. I mean, there wasn't a lot of people who could talk with about it. So when I read the chapter on the Babaji's cave, 
And I was just, uh, I got to go there. No, I have to go there before I die. And I'm going to be, I'm, 50, I'm getting close to 59 here. I'm 58 and a half. I, I got to go. And the whole life I wanted to go, I, I got to go. It was 2004. And so I talked a friend dude to it, a Vietnam vet friend of mine. And we got on the airplane and we flew here and, and I hired a car and a driver. We found the ashram that handled that cave. They were the, like the guardians of this cave. And you had to go there and you had to get permission. You had to show you were serious study of Kriya Yoga. And, uh, and, and, and then you had to have an escort up there. I mean, it was the whole thing. So we get there and they got some festivities and, and stuff going on. So they, nobody there but a Swami and, and his helper. And the Swami's going to leave in a couple of days. So he says, hey, look, I, I got nobody can show you. Nobody can guide you there. Uh, and it's hard to find. I mean, you have to have somebody who can guide you up this mountain and path and everything. So I wouldn't take no for an answer. I said, look, I, I, I waited, you know, 50 years to get here. And I, I'm not leaving until I, I could see that. He says, well. The only day you can go is possibly tomorrow, because after that, we're all gone. The ashram's closed up, and, and we have to give you a key to get into the, the, the temple there. We had a key to get into the cave. They had to actually put barred doors on the cave, because locals would be chopping off rocks and stuff and selling them, you know, for Babaji's cave or rock, right? Yeah. Devotees would come and take and put it on their altar. So it was like they, they couldn't trust spiritual vandals, I call them. Yeah, you think the sacred place, right? Yeah. So I spend the night there and picture this because most people don't picture an old fashioned ashram in the Himalayas. It is so cold you can see your breath. I mean, you're a pie, right? But you can see your breath. I mean, they're in, in the October, November, and it was like cold. And they give me this wooden bed, wood, no mattress, wood. I put a blanket on it just to get a little cover between me and the wood. And then he said, you need a blanket to cover you. And, and there's no glass windows. The windows are, are screened with uh, uh, shutters, wooden shutters, you know. So the wind was always coming through. And, and then he gave me a bucket of water for my bath in the morning. And in the morning, it had, you know, like a sixteenth of an inch of ice on it. <laughs> I'm going to wash with that. Right? Anyway, so I wake up. There, but to me, that was it was invigorating. It was like. It could be a, in a Himalayan. You got to be cold and bundled up in a blanket in, in, in an ashram in Himalayas, right? Come on, right? <laughs> I mean, that's poetic. So the next morning I wake up and, and, and they feed us. I have a potato and a handful of lentils and some tea. The Swami comes out and talks to me. He goes, hey, I don't know if you can handle this, he says, but uh, if you want to go, I'll give you directions. If you can follow them. So I said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So we get in, the, get in the car, we're driving, we're going on this path, and then we see the sign, except the sign, somebody pulled it out of the ground and threw it up on another hillside. We have to look over that way, we see the sign laying, we pick it up, and we have no idea where the trail's at, because there's about 10 cattle trails, animal trails going up this mountain, you know, animals make a, a path up a mountain, you could tell, you know, cows been going up there. So we just chose one at random, we got lost. And at this time in India, I was, uh, it was three weeks I was in country and I'd caught some kind of bug, uh, dysentery, I won't give any details, but yeah, I was having, I lost 28 pounds in three weeks. So, you know, I wasn't feeling too good. And we took this trip being very optimistic. We didn't take any water. We didn't take any food. We didn't take a jacket, didn't take a flashlight, didn't take matches. We just thought for a stroll, we're going to climb this mountain in the Himalayas, right? All right. And I'm having, I've had a couple of heart attacks before then. So I had heart problems. I knew I had heart problems. And I, and I was also fighting epilepsy. Uh, in the war, I got blown up by a rocket and it knocked me out. And uh, I've had, at, up to that point, I was having epileptic seizures once in a while. So minor details, <laughs> really healthy going up this mountain. So finally, we're totally exhausted. We're totally lost. And then I look up there and we see the in the, the horizon on top this mount, side of the mountain, there's a temple. Got to be it because there's nobody else around. We finally get up there. We got the key. We unlocked the door. It's Babaji's temple. We got a big portrait of him on the wall. I'm exhausted. My heart's going boom, 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 boom. But I'm not sweating. I think, well, I'm okay. There's no sweat. 
which, you know, you're dehydrated, right? Obviously you got a problem. Uh, so we rested and then we left the back out the door there. And we went up the last part of the journey was a couple hundred yards straight up pretty much. And these you know, steps, and then you get to the other and there's the, the cave. We unlock the cave door, we go in, I sit down and I meditate. And then I took out, I had four sheets of typed paper, two sides, ten, number 10 Adisha, you know, the small print, single space, you know. I had written down, I sat down for a couple of months before I left, and I kept writing down people in my life that I'd run into that I wanted to pray for and ask Bob G to bless. I'm talking about, I, I had some things, I didn't know who, what they are guys. I said, Hitchhiker I picked up in 1990. I mean, that would be, that's all I wrote. I figured God knows who these people are, like, I, just because I can't remember them, right? Uh, old bosses, people in the military, uh, family, friends, enemies, uh, old bosses, you know, good ones, bad ones, children, siblings. I mean, if you lived in my neighborhood or you went to high school with me or you were in the army with me, if I remembered you, you were on this list. And they were like just squeezed in there. And I took it to all these holy spots in, in India. Wherever I went, I had it in my pocket next to my heart. And, and I asked for prayers for it. But when I got to Babaji's cave, I actually took it out and mentally read each name. Like hitchhiker, 17-year-old hitchhiker, 22-year-old hitchhiker I picked up. And then I put the list back in my pocket. Skipping ahead. A month later, I'm going down to Ganges River in Vernassa, I think it was. And at sunrise, and I take the list out because the sun's coming up and we're going down to Ganges River. And I take, uh, I read it and I take a candle and I burn it. And then I drop the ashes in the Ganges. So that holy list I carried around all over these places. And then I consecrated it in the uh, Ganges River at sunrise. It was really kind of neat. Anyway, so we leave this cave. I'm high from praying and everything, I think, but I'm getting dizzy and my heart is just pounding in my chest. You can see my shirt go. I mean, it's just jumping out of my chest. And so actually I get us lost again because the guy's following me. <laughs> he goes, ah. So we're standing next to a 30 foot cliff, but it's not, it's not a sheer drop. It actually has kind of a, kind of an angle. So when I've, lose consciousness, which I did, and I fall off this cliff, I'm going to take a couple of bounces. So 30 feet with a couple of interruptions. <laughs> and then boom, on a boulder. And I'm laying on my back on a boulder after falling 30 feet. Okay. And I'm looking up at the sky. You know, and it's like that cartoon, The Simpsons, you know, and you show the sky, and it, you know, it goes, the clouds. It was just like that. It was like, The Simpsons. I'm looking up at the sky. Next thing you know, I go from feeling all this god awful pain, you know, boom, boom, and pain to nothing. I go, oh, oh I've, I've had that feeling before. In fact, I've, I have this light feeling too. And then I realize as I'm looking up the clouds that I am up above. And I look down, and there's my, there's this body laid out there. And I'm going, wow, I, I feel sorry for that guy because he's hurt. <laughs> It's like, you know, I'm not him, you know, it's, it's easy. And I'm going, well, you know, if this is it, this is all right. I've just been to Babaji's cave, someplace I wanted to go since I was in the hospital, you know, as eight eight year old, right? So this is it. This is okay. It's a good way to go, right? Die in India on the search, right? And, uh, and I'm looking down at my body and uh, out of the grass, coming across my sandals and my feet and everything is a big cobra. Now, my wife gets mad at me. She says, well, first time you told that story, it was only seven foot. Last time you said it was a king cobra. It's, it's gotten to be 15 feet. So anyway, being Irish, there's that problem. But I never really knew when I say it was a, a huge cobra. If you're laying, your body's laying down and one is crossing your body, you don't see the tail coming out of the grass and it takes, it takes, 45 seconds for it to go across your boots, 45 seconds more, uh, or so, you're going to remember it only as it was a huge snake, right? I mean, it's like, you're not going to quiver over. Anyway, so it was like defibrillator paddles, those paddles that the doctors have, 
clear, and you jump up. When I saw the snake, it was like that. But it wasn't out of fear. It was out of total love for that snake. It was like, oh, my God, I got I to gotta touch it. So I jump up. And all of a sudden, my heart goes into rhythm. It's beating, you know? And I'm clear-eyed, and, and I'm fully awake. And I start, my friends watch me from the cliff. They got crazy. He's looking down. What are you doing? What are you doing? And then I start trying to grab the body of this thing. And I got my hands like this. I can't get my hands to touch around. Trying to get the snake, I couldn't get my fingertips to, to touch. There's a space of an inch or two. I I can't get it all the way around the snake. So I don't know how big that is, but that's pretty good size, right? I mean, it's like a bulk constrictor or something. I've never seen a cobra that big. It was huge. And again, in my mind, it was huge, right? And I couldn't touch. So I keep trying to grab it. I, I, I grab right behind the neck and I grab it. And it keeps slithering through my hands. Never turns around and tries to attack me. It just keeps slithering. And it goes and goes and goes. And I'm chasing it with my sandals, bare feet, you know, and sandals. I'm chasing it through this tall grass. Right? You know, it could turn around. It could circle back on me. I don't know. And I follow it until we come to this little, about a nine-foot cliff. And there's a little trickle of a waterfall coming down. And the snake goes up behind the waterfall, turns around, curls up, and then just does this right behind the waterfall. And I'm looking at it just mesmerized. I'm going, wow. Because if you, if you ever read autobiography, it talks about how Babaji manifested this golden palace for Larry Masha to get rid of his desire. And afterwards, he was told to go down by the stream by those little waterfall and wash and bathe. And, and then he'd meet and talk to him later. And I'm looking at that and I go, this is where he bathed. This is where he bathed. And uh, that's all the thought I had in my mind. Is I'm like, and the cobra's looking at me, you know, about three, four feet away. And I'm looking at the cobra and I'm just feeling bliss. I'm thinking, no, I can never find this place again. I mean, I have to fall off a cliff to find it. I didn't know where I was at, but there, there's that. And I'm saying, this is where that golden palace thing took place. This is it. This is where he went and watched so we finally, my buddy says, no, this, he says, let's just follow, we're lost. Let's follow the, the water down. Water always goes down, right? It'll always go to civilization. We found a farmer's house. These kids, we paid some kids to help us find our vehicle. Get back. I was given instruction by the Swami. I'm going to give you these keys. You go out, go see it. But you got to be back by 530 because I'm going to lock up the gates here. And this thing's, you'll be able to get, you, you're not going to get in. You'll have to stay someplace else. I'm locking this place up. So we get there at 5.29 as he's outside with the keychain. And, and he laughs at me and he asks me how it went, right? So I tell him the whole story about having a problem with this, Terry. When I, when I, and then I I picked up this, uh, like, poison oak, poison ivy, whatever they got there. I got welts all over my body from going off the trail, you know. So I'm, I'm hurting there. And then from falling off the clips, I got scrapes. I got bumps. I got scratches. The shirt's turned torn it's got dirt on it i got dirt on my face and, and i'm dehydrated and i'm telling the story with such joy right oh yeah this happened this happened. then i fell off a cliff and i died and you know i'm telling the whole story and he's just smiling into this there was a woman there about late 30s and she goes mr 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 she kept interrupting she says don't you know what they say and she said that about five times finally i stopped i said okay i'll bite what do they say and she goes, those that go to Babaji's cave and who have the greatest uh, adversities and, and trials to go there uh, have the greatest blessing. And then she walks away, right? And I go, what? Who's this lady? <laughs> so if you had a, all this stuff happens to you, you're supposed to consider it a blessing. It's just like, that's great, right? So I think, okay, great. Then I added, if you had to have a terrible, if you had to have all this stuff happen, I qualified, right? So I come back, and in December, I, I go to the doctor because I, I've been sick for this. Typical man, I have a heart attack in late October, right, and survive. I go to the doctor, never. I come back. I, I don't go to the doctor the whole rest of that year, right? But I go to the doctor because all of a sudden I have a, uh, uh, what, what turns out to be a cancerous uh, tumor in my spiritual eye, right? Right where there's a scar there. And and I go there and they go, yeah, your, uh, your area between the eye right here. I said, what do you mean, the spiritual eye? 
He said, well, call it anything you want, but that's right there. He says, we're going to have to operate. He says, that's, you got a real bad cancer sitting there. Just a little. And I was so happy. I go, how cool is that? I mean, I'm crazy. Right? I said, how cool is that? I go to India looking for enlightenment. I'm looking for that guru on the mountaintop experience. And I come back from India and I'm going to operate and remove the cancer from my spiritual life. I mean, how symbolic can you get, right? It's like, wow, that's cool, right? So my wife thought I was nuts, of course. I, I came home and I took the bandage off because they had nine big stitches. And I go, that's just too cool. I got to show it off, right? She goes, you're crazy. You're crazy. Anyway, my wife knows me well. So there you go. So here's the kicker. I still, I didn't tell the doctor about the heart problem. So that was December. January rolls around. February. Beginning of February. Uh, I'm having a bunch of heart attacks. I'm collapsing in my garage. I'm collapsing, you know, uh, and, and I'm having heart pains and all, all this stuff. And so I tell my wife, I go, I'm having a little problem. I'm having a major heart attack at the time. I said, I'm going to drive to Kaiser. I'm going to go to the ER just to check out, see if I'm okay. Want me to drive you? Nah, I got it. So I drive seven miles. It takes 10 minutes to find parking. You know, hospitals are, right? 10 minutes to find parking. I walk to the ER. I walk in. You know, the, the real bad patients are over here coming in by ambulances, right? They get taken care of. The walk-ins got to stand in a line and register, right? So there's 18 people or so in line. I, I get this line. It's about oh, 15 minutes. And my heart's, I'm having a major, major heart attack. And I'm just not saying nothing. I'm in the line. I get up there. And uh, the lady asked me one question. One question. Do you have insurance here? I go, yeah. That was it. That was the only question I got asked. I said, yeah. So they had me a clipboard with a bunch of papers. I should fill this stuff out and get that line. So I said, okay. Nobody asked me, are you bleeding? Can you breathe? I, you know, Nothing. So I, I fill it out and I go to the next line. There's only five, six people maybe. And I get up there and the nurse takes the thing and she says, there's a question. What's wrong with you? Why are you coming in? I said, well, I'm having a heart attack right now. And she laughs. <laughs> she says, yeah, I'll be the judge of that. Just how'd you get here? And I saw her, I drove. And I told, and you park? Yeah. And you walked over here? Yeah. And you stood there? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So she takes out her stethoscope, goes through the, the motions. And she listens to my heart. Next thing you know, she's pushing a button and this flashing light goes, code blue, code blue, code blue. I go, I'm looking around. Somebody's in trouble, man. What's going on? <laughs> Next thing you know, the cart's coming and they sat me in this cart. All of a, Nobody was paying a damn attention to me at all. And, and then all of a sudden, it's like emergency, right? Don't look around. It's me. I guess I'm the code blue, right? So they take me in this room and the doctor comes in and he wants to immediately do an operation. He says, oh, no, no, let's, let's talk about this. And then while, while I'm there, he says, no, you're he says, you're having a full-blown heart attack. You've been having one. When did it start? And I said, I don't know, three, four hours ago. He goes, oh, my God. You know? So, uh, But I'm just like this, just calm. I mean, just – and then I start to complain a little bit. I go, you know, this is really kind of kind of odd. I said, look, I said, I've been a vegetarian, you know, for uh, about 60 years almost. Uh, I don't drink any booze. I don't do any drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. Uh I don't do salt. I don't do chocolate. And the guy looks at me and says, you don't have much of a life. <laughs> anyway, so I went through this whole list. I exercise. I do yoga. I meditate. And then he looks at me after he looks at all these tests and he says, Mr. McDonald, I, I, I believe that if you hadn't done that all your life, that with your genetics, you'd been dead by 29 instead of going on 59, because I was going to be 59 three weeks or something. So then I'm going 29, 59. So remember those two numbers? That's when those two numbers came into play. So that was number one and number two, near-death experience. Number three is, is really involved. I don't know if you have time for me on this one. So you go to India once, you're going to go back. It really is the most interesting place in the world. You have total ignorance and stupidity and things that will make you angry and mad. And then you got things that are going to totally bliss you out and just going to blow you away with like, my God, this is sacred. This is wild. This is what? And you have every emotional experience in between. But everything can happen in one day. It's like you can go from crazy people on the street to, you know, on a train or something to being in this blissful temple someplace or 
a, with a sacred person. I mean, it's just, but if you're really on a spiritual journey, you really need to not punch any time cards. Don't even look at a calendar. Forget the watch. Just go until you feel it. If you can. Uh, my wife was very flexible and uh, she thought I was crazy. So anyway, so I'm gone three, four months at a time. I, I, I wasn't texting home or not that I didn't have a smartphone and the internet out where I was at was non-existent. Uh, I, I barely had electricity in places I say that. And if I had electricity, it was only a few hours a day, a few days a week. So it was a, a primitive journey, really. But I went back in 2011. And that's where on my way back to India in 2011, I stopped in Germany. I get to, Ger I get to India in January and the guru at this ashram was having me go around and introduce them in Mumbai and Pune and these, these big arenas and stuff to, to, to groups like uh, three or 400 women at the Pune uh, uh, Professional Women's Club or whatever it was called in, in Pune and then some stadiums where there were several thousand people. And I ended up at one of them having a heart attack. Uh, and afterwards, I was just going to let it go being me, right? Oh, I'm okay now. So the guru's wife made me go to an uh, ER. I go to an ER. I walk in. They put me on a, on a, on a bed that somebody's just got, just this old dirty guy just got off of. They didn't change nothing. They just laid me in there. And on the floor was, you know, these tongue depressors thrown away, laying there. There was a couple of needles laying in a, in a trash can. And I'm going, oh, boy, this is going to be good. Anyway, so they come in, they did some stuff, ran an EKG and did all these things. I was there half a day. First question they asked me, what's wrong? How do you feel? What can we do for you? Not, did you have insurance? Do you have money? So it was, like, oh, well, this is a new start. And then I got the bill. It was $68 for ER for heart attack. I go, and then somebody else paid for it. God, don't worry about it. I'll get it. Okay, great. So... Uh, and I get back on an airplane and I'm flying back to America and, uh, and I, I get some, you know, you're on an airplane flying 37,000 feet. You just had a heart attack and you're leaving the country to fly back to Sacramento, California. And so we landed Colorado to go through customs and I collapsed in the, in the line when I'm going through customs. And then two paramedics came. And, uh, and they worked on me and they, they made me wait six hours to make sure I was stabilized. Anyway, so I get off, I'm in Sacramento and the first thing I go, I go to my heart doctor and he, I'm going to talk to him about two minutes. He's looking at me and he, he doesn't code blue, but pretty close. Whatever he did, somebody's coming in with a wheelchair and he put me in a wheelchair from his office. They take me straight to ER, check me in and I don't go home again. That was it, right? So four days in an intensive care unit. ICU because I wasn't strong enough for the surgery. And so they're going to give me open heart surgery. Then they transfer into the hospital. All right. So now we get into the other near death experience. And this is not comparable to anyone I've ever heard. It's totally different. There's no past life review. Again, there's something about the future happening, but there's, also not a tunnel. There's not this body of light. There's this, I go from the hospital table to India with a solid body. It's, it's, uh, it wasn't like I astral traveled there, had a dream or a vision. I actually was, yeah, there's, there's a word for that. I can't come into my mind there, but my body was actually in two places at the same time. And it was a real body. So I go into the surgery and I'm butt naked. I don't know. I think surgeons say they want you to have your clothes on. You're always naked. So, you know, and I go, well, at least give me a sheet. This is cold. It was like 40 degrees in the room, right? So I'm laying there and they're getting ready to give me a shot. I'm going to go out. And I said to the guy, I said, what are you going to really do? He says, well, we're going to, his words, we're going to rip the chest open. I go, well, that's a great bedside man already. I'm really impressed with this guy. I'm going to rip your chest. Not, not we're going to surgically open it. No, we're going to rip it open, <laughs> you know, and we're going to put this device. He shows me the device. Looks like, you know, it's going to hold it open. And he's got, looks like a saw. And something looks like clippers you use to cut branches on trees. I'm going, 
you know, cut the ribs or something. I'm going, what? It's really impressive and making me feel really comfortable. And, and he goes, he says, and then he says, uh, we're going to stop your lungs and we're going to stop your heart. And we're going to hook you up to this machine and your blood's going to flow in this machine and be oxidized. And then it's going to flow back in your body. So you will not be breathing. Your heart will not be beating. And he says, and if we don't have any electrical outlets, this machine will keep running, which was his little joke, which I thought, in my mind, I go, can they have a the hospital's got a generator back up? I'm thinking that in my mind. I'm going, he's like, got me thinking, which I never even thought about, right? That was really great. So, uh, so I asked him, I said, well, basically you're telling me that my life is being maintained on a machine and I'm not breathing and my heart's not beating. I said, isn't that the definition of death? He goes, well, well, yeah, you're, you're, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. If you were on the machine, yeah, your body's dead, but we're keeping it oxidated. You know, it's not going to deteriorate. We'll take care of it while you're gone. That was his other joke. We'll take care of it while you're gone. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, and then he warns me just, before, just, just, I'm sorry to adjust to that. He goes, Oh, by the way, when you're on the machine, my anesthesiologist can't give you the full maximum amount of anesthesia because you know, it's dangerous, you know, cause it's so you, he says, he says only about 5% of the people feel anything. Duh. So, so I'm thinking already Duh, lungs go off. Yeah. Okay. I, I've been there before. So, I get a shot. I count backwards from nine, of 99 to, to, I don't know, only thing I remember, 96, 97. I don't, I'm out. As soon as it's black, boom, I'm out of the body. All of a sudden, I'm standing in southern India at Shiva Temple. And I knew it was a Shiva Temple because I look up, and there's that bull, you know, the bull that's yeah. slow, you know, into the temple or whatever. And, uh, all Shiva temples have that bull outside. And then I remember I had a uh, Indian knotty palm leaf reading done. And in that reading was one of the predictions of the future was that at some time in the future, which was pretty close to the date I'm having this operation, uh, that you will be pulled to, you'll go to this place, whatever pulled to means. You'll go to this this Hindu temple in Southern India, they gave the name of it and everything. And when you get there, there'll be a hill. And you will know to walk up that hill for two to four hours, depending on how fast you walk. And when you get to the top of that hill, on the top of that hill will be sitting uh, Augusta and all, and, and all the rishis. The great ones, the great rishis will be there. And they'll be sitting around. And, and when you get there, you will not have one question to ask them because you will know it all. So I thought it was just kind of, okay, it's symbolic. There's something happening here symbolically. So that was the prediction. And I, I thought, well, if I do anything, that'll be, I'll take a real hike and I'll go to this place. So that was not even on my mind going into this operation, but that was the prediction. So when all of a sudden my consciousness is aware of where my surroundings are, and I'm looking at the Shiva temple, I automatically know that's the temple. I go, that's the temple. So I'm looking around and I see this pathway up a, up a hill. And then I realize as I'm looking around, because the thought comes to me, well, if I'm instantly transported here, last time I saw myself, I was buck ass naked on a table, you know, operating table. Uh, so I'm looking, oh, so at least when these things happen, biolocation, that's what I was thinking for. At least these things happen, I'm clothed, right? I'm modestly clothed and leave like I normally dress. And so actually, that was actually a concern on my part. Not not like, what am, what am I doing here? Am I going to get back? Am I dead? No, my first concern is, do I have clothes on? That was it. That was my only concern. You know, it was like, what an idiot I am. I mean, I'm looking back at this. All the questions I could have had, all the concerns, and the only thing I'm thinking about is, am I naked? I mean, oh my gosh, you know, go look, right? Anyway, so then I could feel people bumping into me breathing on me, looking at me, talking. You know, they could hear me, they could see me, they could feel me, they could touch me. It was a real body. It was me there, but I was also acutely aware that I was also on the operating table because I could feel hands and tools and surgical things inside of my chest. I mean, I could feel this stuff going on at the same time. And I remember, 
uh, I'm on a heart lung machine now and uh, the medication is it's not working right. So I'm kind of aware of something's going on, right? So I, I go, well, you know what? The, the naughty reading I had said walk two to four hours. So I said, this operation could take eight hours, they told me. So I'm walking. All right, what else are we going to do? I'm in India. Let's go we'll see, we'll see what happens. Right? So I walk up this hill. Make the most of it. Yeah. So I, I get to the top and it's just like was described to me. And, you know, these wild rishis, these ascended masters are all up there, right? So I walk into the group and they're sitting on stumps and rocks and a couple are standing and some are sitting on the ground, you know, in a lotus position. And, and I'm looking around and going, yeah, I don't have any questions. I was good, right? So I, so I sat down, there's a little fire going. And then it ended up the, uh, the guru at the ashram I was staying at when I, when I go to India, he was there. He went off. And uh, he was standing there like this, like he was going to tell me something, right? So he looks at me and he says, you can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. And he said that a couple of times. Said, well, you know. All of a sudden, Again, the clouds. Remember the clouds from my first my first one? I get those clouds again. I'm going, okay, the show is about to start, right? What's going on here? Right? So the clouds are forming, right? I still got these rishis standing around me, but there's clouds in, in the background. And I hear a voice. Angelic, sweet, sacred voice. It sounded like the most beautiful woman in the world was talking to you, you know, and she sounded like in her 20s. I mean, I don't want to put it on that level, but it was just, if, you, if you're a Hollywood director wanting to have the voice of an angel, that's who you, that voice, that's it. Nail it. That's what we want, right? I mean, it was just like classic, you know, it was just this loving, soft, embracing tone. And she goes, just give it up. Stop breathing. Just let it go. You've done everything you're supposed to do. You don't owe anybody anything. You're done. You don't need to have pain. You don't have to need suffering. Just give up the heart. Just give it up. I promise you bliss, joy, uh, love, all these things, right? And she just goes on and on about all this great stuff. And, and I'm going, wow, that's really kind of cool. Yeah, she just come with me. I got all this for you. And then the guru guy standing like this goes, be up. Don't give up heart. You can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. I go, whoa, whoa, what do you offer me? He says, I'm offering you more pain than you ever had, more suffering than you ever had, and more work. And I go, all right. I said, so I've had this conversation with you. Like, you're trying to entice me to stay in your sales pitches. Uh, I'm offering you pain and suffering. And she's offered me bliss and joy and love. Duh. And you want me to choose this? And then he kind of does this thing. And then the panorama fills in with faces of people, thousands of people, and a few dogs and a couple of cats and a few animals, but it's almost all people, young, old, sick, healthy, male, female, different races. It was everything. It was from next. And he just goes and he says, if you don't choose to come back, you don't owe these people anything. But none of these people will get the gift that you could give them. I mean, some people need a love. Some people need understanding. Some people just need a hug. Some people need instruction. Some people need inspiration. Some people need hope. Some people need healing. All levels. Some are small. Some are big. But all these, and there was thousands who just kept rolling by face after face. All these souls will miss what you could give them. But you got to take more pain on. You got to take more suffering on. And I'm going, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that because I'm starting to feel this great pain from the operation. I mean, it's just not doing good, right? And so this is going back and forth. And all of a sudden, on the operating table, there's this, they, they reinstalled by, you know, the, the ar arteries to the heart and everything. And, and uh, they got my lungs getting ready to go. And I feel this paddle go on my chest, a little electronic thing go, chink. And so I'm standing on this hill and all of a sudden it's like, I get this electrical current, chink. And now I'm on the operating table. I'm, I'm gone. I'm not in India anymore. I'm on an operating table. 
in Sacramento, California. So I go from Southern India instantly to Sacramento, California. And I feel everything that they're doing. And, and I got I got tube down my throat. I can't talk. I got my eyes taped shut. And I can't move. And I, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, in my mind, I'm telling them, I'm going, hey, I, I can feel everything. How about another shot? How about something, right? Next half hour, 45 minutes with no anesthesia, it's worn off. And I hear the guy going, the anesthesia or something. I just kind of hear his voice kind of going, you know, he probably doesn't have much anesthesia. I, I think he may be feeling things. And the doctors go, oh, we're going to close up here in 10 minutes. It's like, <laughs> what? And pulling the rib cage together and wiring it together. And, everything. and inside I'm going, I mean, I feel absolutely everything they're doing. I'm going, hey, I'm yelling in my mind, right? Hey, you know. And then they wheel me out and I'm in a room for several hours. It's too, being awake and conscious and having that tube down your throat, it's really miserable. But I kept filling up with fluids and blood at five blood transfusions. So finally, and every time I dozed off, if I, if I started to go to sleep, if I daydreamed, I was instantaneously back in that conversation on the mountain. I didn't have to climb the hill anymore, but I was back when there with this whole thing about here's the faces, make a choice. And I'm hearing the guru saying, he says, before you didn't feel much pain, you rose blissed out. You could take, I mean, I used to go to the dentist, you know, drill down to the nerve. I, don't give me a shot, just drill it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they look like a, a guitar player, you know, playing those high notes when they go, ee! that's what the dentist looks like drilling, right? They're like, and I'm just, do it. Yeah, but I'm in your nerve. I go, I know, I feel it. Well, no, that's okay. Just boom. So, but now I'm being promised that no longer will I be able to bliss out on pain that I had to learn how to handle it like a regular person. So I could teach others to handle pain. So it's about 11, I don't know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And they're getting ready to wheel me out for emergency, uh, another blood transfusion and some other stuff. And phone rings next to the, the hospital bed. And I said, I got to answer that. I got to answer that. You know, barely, I'm barely functioning. And so I pick it up and it says, Eve, this is Gurnoff in India. And I, in my mind, I'm going, yeah, how many Gurnoffs Gurnoff, so I know? I'm glad you limited it down to just the one in India. It's like, come on. And uh, so <laughs> it was, next thing out of his mouth was, Eve, don't give up your heart. You could skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. And I'm going, my God, so I've been heard for 10 days, right? Same exact words. And then it still hasn't gotten me, though. I still haven't gotten it. So then he goes, you? I just sent 100 people up to the temple at the ashram. I sent 100 people to this temple to pray for you. And I told them I was going to heal you. You wouldn't want to make the guru a liar, would you? <laughs> I told my wife, I said, what? I told my wife, I said, I'm out of here in 36 hours. Yeah, but you got all this. I said, I'm out of here. That's it. I, 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 it's too selfish of me to die. It's like, you know, come on, you know. So, so all this other stuff didn't tempt me, but it was like, if I, you make you make the guru a, a liar. That's just like, I can't do that. So, uh, one of the other predictions that was in my reading that I had the, the year before was that one day that I would find myself having Lord Shiva or or his or, his, or Babaji or you know at that level of of of, of a, a personage would visit me and bless me and christen me with oil and water on my head, and I thought, well, okay, yeah, you know, okay, you know, it's a prediction. I I'm sitting there in the bed the day before I leave like a crystal ball, half of it, you know, like a, like a crystal uh, bowl put over the bed. It's just energy and nothing. I can't see anything outside of it. But at the end of my bed, I'm looking at Babaji, just like you see, except, you know, he's got no shirt on. He's got the long hair. He's young, but it's my vision. He's wearing Levi's, no shoes, but he's wearing Levi's. 
and he's dumping oil and water and he's chanting and he's touching my forehead. Now, realize I'm in a bed that's about six and a half, seven feet long. And he's at the end of the bed and his hands are up here and there pouring that and he's standing in front of the bed, which doesn't make any sense, right? But you know, in, in, it's all yeah. relevant. So I'm blissed out thinking, well, maybe I'm just crazy, who knows? You know, so I don't say anything, it happens. I get home from the hospital a couple of days and my daughter comes over and she says, you know, David, our old neighbor? I go, yeah, yeah, David. You know, he was like 40 some years old at the time. And uh, no, I wouldn't call him religious or spiritual. I think he's just, just a really nice guy. He says, yeah, he went to visit you on uh, you know, your last day there or so. And I said, no, he didn't. He says, oh, he said he went there. I said, no, I didn't see him. He didn't. Talk. He said he went there and he got in the doorway but there was some crazy young Indian guy chanting some insane language, pouring stuff on your head. And he thought it was funny because the guy had no shirt on. And uh, and he, he was embarrassed for you and he left. So I told her the story and she goes, oh my gosh, it was Babaji. He saw Babaji, right? So that was why the universe told me, no, he went crazy here. Somebody else saw it. And he saw it. That's why the guy had to have Levi's on. He couldn't, you know. They had Levi's on, no shirt on, you know. So um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So that's right. that's that's the first essence. And each one of those little stories, I could spend an hour, or half, or more on details. But this is because your show is short. <laughs> so, I know we had to cram three of them in here, but you know, done a spectacular job at at uh, getting them all in. I, I talk about the. the Near death experience, the first one in this book called Warrior, Spiritual's Odyssey, uh, and uh, and then if you uh, if you're just interested in this crazy stuff in India, Alchemy of a Warrior's Heart, uh, this book deals with two of those near death experiences, but it meets all all these holy men I met, and all the supernatural mystical things that happened both in India and coming back, and it's about a ten year journey and the other one's my life story up until 10 years before that book my new book which i'm working on uh, since you asked is i still remember tomorrow and uh you know because being old some people have trouble remembering the past uh getting older i'm having a hard time remembering tomorrow but i still do there's it's not that difficult it's just basically a parlor trick it's, anybody can do it it's just think of think of your whole life Let's go low tech. Your whole life is on a VCR team, right? You're in the middle of it someplace. You don't even know where, right? You're, this thing's playing. That's what's on the screen. But you got all this footage before, and you got all this footage afterwards. All you got to do is rewind it to where you want to see it, and you'll see the past. You'll see the future. It's all there already. So it's the same thing remembering the future. You just got to look at a different part of the VCR tape of your life or lives, and you just slide there. So what what, it, are you tapping into a frequency, like suggesting to tap in some sort of frequency in order to do that? Because I mean, we could dream about the future, or we can we can. Um, oh, no, this is more like you can be in the future, or you can be in the past. And sometime, if you want to explore that, I can I can give you an instant that happened in at two different times in my life, about fifty years apart, where I talked to the old old me and the young me at the same time, and remember from both ends. I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, so that's that's unusual. Uh, Really? At least, at least, I don't know. So uh, each experience teaches you something, but people can't look for experiences. If you're looking for experiences, then you're really missing the whole spiritual journey. It's like people meditating. They're meditating so they can be clairvoyant. They're meditating so they can be uh, astral travelers. They're meditating so they can be a healer. They're meditating for all these reasons. Even even they're meditating to get enlightened. And I'm telling them, no. Time for meditation is time to love the divine. End of story. You're there to give love. If you get nothing back, that's okay. Don't analyze it. Just time in love with God. So meditation should be just about loving God. Real meditation is dead silence, listening to God. And God will talk to you. That's when you learn how to shift to the future or the past. That's where you learn about real love. But you shouldn't be doing it for any reason other than just sit with God. And you will find 
experiences will come, but that's not why you're there. And so I, I, I meet too many people always analyzing, wow, oh, I'm trying to get this spiritual experience. I'm trying to get nothing ever. I said, forget it. Just love. Expect nothing back. You'll never be disappointed. Just love. Spread love. Spread love. If there's one thing, just one thing that you could um, convey to those that are watching right now about, I mean, you know, souls about this life and earth and the experience, what would it be? We're here for one purpose. And it may take multiple looks. It may look like it's different things. But I tell people you're here to love, serve, and forgive. But you roll out all into love. So you are uh, one heck of an evolved and sweet soul. And I think we could probably do another two or three episodes. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> and I would love to if you're ever game. I would love to have you back on here. When you get bored, call me up. <laughs> I'm going to take you up on that. Trust me. Yeah, see this fellow behind me here says, never grow up. Never grow up. I was saying that. Uh, James Thomas and Serena, is, is, uh, his partner, sent that to me for my birthday. And I, I really, it kind of sums up things because you know what? Everybody's overrated the importance of adulthood and being mature. If you can't still play and laugh and see life in a simple manner, if you can't enjoy a SpongeBob cartoon, I mean, come on, you got to reach some point in life where I tell people, stop being so serious about being serious, you know? Yeah. So spiritually, I'm telling you not to be serious. And well, I think you're wonderful. I'm really so happy that you were uh, able to come on and, and share all of this with everyone. And uh, it's just all so interesting and, and real. I really loved it. Thank you so much for being here. My, my honor, my pleasure. I just hope when people watch this, okay, first off, a couple of things. One, yeah. I got channel they can't get enough of me uh reverend bill mcdonald rev period bill mcdonald uh, on youtube and i got a uh, 135 or 140 videos on there plus uh, if you just google on or if you just search on youtube i have got about 1800 videos out that i've done on other people's channels yeah. uh, so I, I you'll find them eventually if you just keep going through there there's for sure. We'll put on anything you want to link in the description too. We'll put all your social media. All right. It's been so great. Thank you again for, uh, for coming on and, and I had such a great time with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Like I said, if you want to do more, just call me up. I think we should. All right. God bless. Thank you so much.